Coming up on Lakes TV. Food and drink is a really important part of the of, of the visitor experience. It's uh, we've we've recognised for some time that there's if we really need to grow the value of tourism and the, and the volume of visitors that come, um, we need to develop Cumbria as a bit of a foodie paradise. Welcome to the Taste Cumbria Food Summit and welcome to the wonderful Reghead Centre. Well, I think this is a tendency to think that, that Cumbria is just a place of, you know, of, of wonderful landscape, of, uh, of hills, valleys, lakes and so on. And in fact, nestling in among that beautifully broken up um, countryside are some wonderful food producers that I've, I, you know, I've just been discovering all my life. I mean, I could take on a little personal tour. But, um, and, and I think that the quality of these, of these foods is sort of defined partly by you know, the, the nature of the landscape, but also by you know, Cumbria's own particular history. Um, and, and this has produced really a very particular kind of food culture with some very remarkable products that personally I've become addicted to over the years. Shaw Meats, have been going for about 11 years now. Um, but focusing more on salami now because it's something different, something unique, something that Cumbria's not recognised for really. And I'm all about, our business is all about being different, not being the norm really. So how do Cumbrians take to things like chorizo? Really well, I mean, say over the last two or three years, the amount of cooking programmes and everything that's been on the telly, and all the top chefs use chorizo and everything like that, and people can't buy it apart from in the supermarket, and they can't buy a British one. I mean, so we've been doing the chorizo now seven years, way before anybody else started doing it. I think there's one or two companies now actually jumping on the bandwagon and starting to do it, but they're way behind, you know. We can do it a lot better and a lot faster, especially in Cumbria. Well, uh, the business is 38 years old and it was started by my father, who's a sheep and beef farmer, um, when the M6 was actually built through his farmland at T-Bay. So um, they had the opportunity to build a very small motorway service area on their land at the time and no one else was really interested in doing that. So um, that's exactly what they did. And um, over the years we've grown incrementally and got bigger. We now have four businesses and we employ 500 people. But the values are still very much as they always were and that is that we are absolutely part of the farm from which we grew and all the lamb and beef that we sell within the business comes from our own farm. We have farm shops, we locally source, we home make on site. So um, there's a there's a sort of um, family cottage industry approach where in every one of our each one of our businesses we want to create a sort of sense of place and a sense that we are Cumbrian and part of our job is to celebrate that and everything that's here. I came to Cumbria today because I was asked to give the critics view, such that it is, of how Cumbrian restaurants can project themselves. And what I really wanted to say is that in a fast expanding food economy, you need to find distinctiveness, you need to find a story. You need to pander to what journalists need, which is a narrative and something to hang on. And that means that local seasonal organic is not going to do it. Just putting that on your menu is not enough look around, work out what it is that can give you a Cumbrian accent and can attract people from all over the country, and particularly, I have to say, from London, because it's the greatest concentration of wealth in this country, and that's where your business is most likely to come from. I mean, you ask many restaurateurs, um, hoteliers, and the first thing they tell you is everything's locally sourced and it's as organic as it can be. Now, is, is that becoming a bit worn? That, oh, it, that it's, uh, there are two things to say. One. It's a platitude. If you're not doing some of those basic things, then I'm not sure why you're in business. What's the alternative? That you're getting it out of the freezer or you're getting it from the local supermarket. Sure, you're looking for the best produce. But it also has to be said, we've reached a point of maturity where it may not be the case that the most local ingredient actually is the best. And the best way to improve a food economy is by not patronising businesses which are not deserving of your trade. Be discriminating about what you purchase because actually by being discriminating you can do as much for a local food economy as you can by just buying the stuff but it has to be much more than that there are a lot of country restaurants in this country now which have exactly the same menu and at one point during my talk I recited it, it was about you know there's a salad there's a risotto there's a sea bass dish a pork belly dish and then at the end a lemon tart a creme brulee and a chocolate fondant why would I come 
for that. What is it about that menu that's distinctive? And if you can't work that out, then move on. Well, for us, um, uh, we've been open eight years now and we've come full circle. We started off with a very locally orientated um, um, ingredients. Uh, we went off on a bit of a tangent, um, but now we've come back fully in the last three years. We only use um, ingredients from, from the county. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll stretch to the northwest, but rarely do we uh, uh, go out of that region. So I think it's very important to have that message because um, there's so many brilliant artisan producers in this county that can, that can match anywhere in the world, really. The type of food that we do, you have to get absolutely right. Um, first comes the, you know, getting your product right, and then you, the, the location comes into it much later. Um, I think that's why in the last couple of years Long Clume's enjoyed increasing success because our location, not only hopefully have we got a good product, um, our location has become part of the experience coming to the Lake District, you know, coming into Cartmel for the first time, it's quite a magical place and our building is, is you know, you, you, you know, I couldn't wish for a better building. So. Our job's almost done, if you like. Where people, we just have to feed people. Then they're all already uh, in awe of, of the area. And we are looking at, at using a lot more British wines, um, but you know, um, I think we're trying to reduce our French list now and increase our beers. Beers is a great passion of mine. There's hundreds of beers that we can be using, fantastic beers, and I'm really interested in matching them with with um, top food, top notch food. Um, so that's something we're really developing on as well. Well, the thing about beer is that every region has its own beers. Every region's got its own breweries. There are now 800 breweries in Britain in total. There are 28 in the county of Cumbria. Uh, and people, when they come on holiday especially, tourists, they don't want the same thing they can get everywhere else. And some pubs offer them, some pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels offer them the same thing they can get everywhere else. When they come here, they want the local produce. And so when they're in pubs, when they want to drink, they want local beers, and those beers are there. And so it's just encouraging people to kind of interface with those beers, get into them, start to learn about them and, and start to stock them in their establishments. I've just been saying in my talk today that there are Michelin starred restaurants around the country with over a thousand wines on their list that stock three mainstream industrially produced lager brands. I think any, beer, any restaurant doing that should be stripped of their Michelin stars. It's quite rare to find a really good restaurant that has a good beer list. But if you think about it, why shouldn't they? If you've got a good wine list, you've got decent bread, you've got decent salt, beer is something that should be up there. And it's great to hear that more and more restaurants are taking beer seriously. So uh, Long Clue sounds like a place I should check. Yeah. It literally tests us to do a back pipe. Uh, the, the Cottage in the Wood is a, is a restaurant with rooms and we specialise in local food, we specialise in foraged foods, so it's really using the food which is around us. And do you feel time, do you feel that you really have to use local food or would you always pick what's best for a particular dish? Well we, we do pick what's best but very often that is from, from Cumbria and very close to, to where we are. But uh, we're not above uh, using food from Lancashire, from, from Yorkshire or from uh, Northumberland for example. As long as it's northern that's the thing. <laughs> in an increasingly congested urban, suburban country and there aren't many parts of the country now where there still is that link between the land and the farmer and the produce and we in Cumbria are one of the few places left where we've never been disconnected in that process and we can offer a very genuine experience where we're absolutely connected and part of the land here and so is the produce so I think that is um, for people seeking authenticity and food experience I think that we are able to offer something quite different. We started off here in this building um, in about 1999, uh, where I'm stood now was a cafe until uh, 2001 really, when the foot and mouth epidemic hit and at that point um, we suddenly found that we had no customers in the cafe and we needed to look at something in order to survive. So we started making a few chutneys and relishes and jams to serve in the cafe and also to sell outside. 
and it started off with um, about three or four different products and we got that up to about 12 in, in the first few weeks. Um, today now we have about 138 different lines and um, more that uh, we'd like to make, we're just running out of space to do it. So um, it's definitely become more consuming really. About three years ago we moved to um, a beautiful 16th century barn just a mile from Hawkshead and it's a, a lovely idyllic setting right on the edge of Essway Lake and um, in there now we have all our offices, our kitchen production and warehousing so we can do everything all under one roof. Um, but it's still made by hand, it's still made um, using the same traditional methods, just bigger pans than we had before. We use a lot of things like um, blackberries and blackcurrants and, and all sorts of things that are available locally. And a lot of the products that we make feature damsons which grow um, really well here in South Lake. So um, it makes sense to use those things that are readily available on the doorstep. But we also make things like mango chutney, which obviously, you know, mangoes don't grow too well here. But, but we'll source them and buy them locally, so it just helps to keep the economy thriving locally. And um, that's very important to us. Hawkshead is a lovely little thriving community. And it, it, it is a lovely place in which to live and work. Well, Mark and I set, set it up together. And um, he's, he heads up all the production and um, all the ordering and comes up with all the ideas. And if, we if somebody else comes up with an idea, then he puts it into practice and creates the recipe. I deal with all the sales, marketing and finance. And um, it works because I stay out the kitchen and he stays out the office. Um, but in amongst that, we've got um, a couple that work for us in the kitchens and they work together. Uh, we've got other couple that work in the shop. Again, married couple that work together. And it's people partly that we've known most of our lives and we all work really well together because we all have the similar feeling for what we're doing and we all um, are very enthusiastic about creating something really special.